I'm uh, sharing a PowerPoint now. Can people see the PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay. This won't take long. So in um, April 5 is our next club meeting. It's a salon meeting. It's going to be uh, the first in-person only meeting we've had for a very long time. Goal is to encourage people to show up if they can. And uh, the images are due as it happens today. So I guess you still have some time to get them in. The assignment is Windows. Um, it's also going to be a, a book giveaway. The club has a, a lot of books that in a what was a library and that we've now decided to just give them away. So those will be available. Uh, as I've said in previous meetings, we have a print competition for the first time since COVID. Uh, and just a reminder that if you do enter prints, uh, they have to be delivered 15 minutes prior to the beginning of the meeting at 6.15. Uh, so remember that also a reminder that for this salon, we also have a new category of smartphone photography. So that'll be interesting to see. Um, upcoming programs uh, later in April, Todd Don Trednick on flower photography. Uh, May 3rd is drone photography by Michael Huber. And May 24 is a presentation, whoops, I, by John Anderson about uh, Badland Adventure. Um, so things, things to look forward to. Uh, also hot off the press, uh, many of you entered images in the Canberra Council Inner Club competition for 2023. And uh, Terry shared with me the results. If you want to see them in detail, go to the Camera Council website. I'll include that in the, the YouTube link that I send out later. Uh, but uh, the that. highlights are that uh, mm -hmm. Melissa Anderson mm -hmm. got a second place for her King Vultures picture and also an award for a tender moment and then chap aiken and terry butler also got an award uh, terry is going to publish the results in uh, in a day or two in more detail uh, a bunch of us got acceptances and honorable mentions again you'll be able to see those in more detail later uh, let's see, last time we'll talk about membership renewals. Uh, 61 members have paid for 2023. There are 12 unpaid members who have gotten a reminder and uh, we don't hear from them by the end of March, their membership will be terminated. So that's it. Um, I will stop sharing. Any questions from anybody before I turn it over to Simon? Okay, there are you? There you are. So I just made Simon the host, but uh, Gary, it's your turn to tell us about Simon and about okay. Hunt Photo. All right, thank you, Steve, I appreciate it. I do recognize a few people on here um, that I talk to regularly, so um, thank you guys for being here. Um, for those who don't know about Hunt's Photo, Hunt's is where a camera store, we're based in Massachusetts, um, and I've been actually working for Hunt's for going on 
my 30th anniversary this year. Um, but um, basically, we're a store in Massachusetts. We ship all over the country. And really, what I strive on more is what's really important to me is 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 the relationship part, relationship part, and building um, building relationships with all my customers, being a resource for them, and really being there more than just um, a salesperson. So, um, if you guys are in need thing, you know, please contact me. I don't, you know, I'm not just call and say hey, I want to place an order. Here's my credit card. I really want to be a resource, be a friend to you, and 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 just and do more than just just talk business so uh, if you need anything reach out to me send me an email um you can follow me on facebook uh, my facebook is gary faber or you can follow me on instagram which is chief faber 33 um noah will send an email at, noah is my assistant and he'll send an email after um you know send an email to steve with with different things we got we got going on but um that's about me what what, what i do um during COVID, I you know during COVID, I, I I before COVID, I was doing close to fifty events a year all around the country. Um, and during COVID, that all came to an end. So I re I did over three hundred Zoom presentations to camera gloves all across the country, and 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 met a lot of new contacts. And that's how I got reconnected with Simon. Um, so that's about me. What 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 I do? Um, and we are getting back and doing in person events. Um. So you, you can we do I have about 10 or 12 in-person events scheduled this year. One, Simon's going to be leading, leading some stuff out with us at the Indiana Dunes, which is a birding festival in Indiana. So if you want more information with that, um, I'll have Noah put that in the email tomorrow. Um, but without further ado, um, so, um, I, I, like I said, I got connected with Simon during during COVID. He's done in, um, probably, I don't know, I lost count, maybe 10, 12 presentations with us already. Um, he's done really incredible job. Um, he's a very knowledgeable person, very knowledgeable birding, and he's been just an honor and a pleasure to work with and develop a, a, a great working relationship and a friendship. And I thoroughly enjoyed working with him. And um, you guys just going to really enjoy his program tonight. He's very knowledgeable about the stuff and um, he's a very passionate person. So without further ado, I'll let Simon take it over. Oh, thank you, Gary. Um, and yeah, I just want to say thank you guys for having me. I, uh, I always, I always love doing these and um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just get right into it. Let's see. Um, ooh, actually, this is going to take one sec. I need to figure out which tab I need to share. Sorry. Just give me one, one second. Ah. I have... Too many Chrome tabs open. <laughs> okay, I think I think that this is it. Let me. All right. Ah. Oh. Um. Hey, I'm so sorry. My computer is telling me that I need to uh, that I need to quit Zoom to be able to open screen recording. Um, I just got a new computer like last month. Um, I will be right back. I'm so sorry about this. It's okay. We're doing good. Um, I'm Steve. I'm making you the host again. Okay. If anyone just joined, we're waiting for Simon to okay. reconnect. There he is. Cool. All right. This should work now. Oh, I think I, you, you do have to make me the host again yep. so that I can screen share. Working on it. Cool. Yeah, so sorry about that. You are the host. Okay. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Here it is. Cool. Cool. All right, can you can you guys see the slideshow? Yes. Awesome. All right, so uh, this is my uh, micro to macro presentation on point and shoot photography. 
Um, I'm Simon Tolzman. I'm a senior at Amundsen High School in Chicago, Illinois. Um, I've been a photographer for uh, a few years now, but I've I've been uh, passionate about uh, wildlife since since age two, um, and that's gone through a whole whole range of interests. I started out with cuttlefish, and then morphed into uh, all things prehistory, and then I and then I I found I found peregrine falcons to be really cool, which turned into a whole obsession with birding. And now here I am. I, I want to, uh, I want to become a botanist when I, when I, as soon as I can, um, I will be going to college at Colorado state university to study conservation biology. Um, and yeah, I would consider myself a, a budding conservationist and just an all around naturalist. Um, I really, I really just love spending as much time as I can out, out in, out in nature, taking photos, just enjoying, enjoying what there is to enjoy. Um, over the last few years, I've, I've personally documented about 5,500 species of living things, um, and just with other stuff that I've noted that I haven't taken a photo of or a recording of, evens out to about 6,000 species. Something I, quite frankly, a few years ago, if you'd have asked me in, if you asked me a couple of years ago, uh, how many species I would have thought I'd found, I surely would not say in over 6,000. So I've definitely come a long way as a, as a naturalist and a birder and really as a photographer. Um, I also do wildlife art um, and yeah, just kind of whatever at the, at the time is, is interesting. I'll, I'll do a drawing. Um, and also I do, uh, like motorsport photography on the side as well. So it's kind of a, just kind of a little bit of everything. Also just landscapes and stuff like that. Uh, interesting city stuff. Um, here, if you, if you would like to, and if you have Instagram, um, these are my, these are my two accounts for the, the first one is for all my wildlife. And then the second one is for sports. I, I do sports photography for my high school um, and uh, all the other stuff. Um, so if you want to write those down or give them a follow, that would be, that would be cool. Um, yeah, so uh, I started wildlife photography in 2016 and it was pretty much just only to get uh, like just to have evidence that I saw what I saw. Um, and I, I did that. I, I did not take very good photos. I just, I had a, I had a Nikon P900, um, which is a fairly entry level, um, point and shoot camera. And I, I, I loved it. I, I can't say I ever really had many problems with it in the time that I used it. Um, and yeah, I, like I said, I just, I took photos of all the birds I saw just to prove that I'd seen them. Um, and I was never really thinking about taking a really good or interesting photo. As you can see, these are all like the composition isn't that great or in the Eastern Phoebe down, down to the right, the highlights are all blown out. Um, so yeah, it was really, it was really just to, to prove that I'd seen something. Then uh, in 2019, I still had the P900 um, and I started to think a little bit more about composition and how to like properly expose a photo and all the, and all the other stuff like that. But as you can see, these aren't, these aren't perfect. They're, they're still not that awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, when the pandemic started and we had so much more time to just be outdoors and like look for, look for wildlife, um, I really, I really just started taking a lot more photos than, than I had previously. Uh, I would say that for me, 2020, the whole COVID pandemic uh, was actually a really good thing for me because I got to spend so much more time out in nature looking for birds. I did a, I did a big year in my, in my home county in Cook County, Illinois. Um, I saw 283 species in, in the county alone in 2020. Uh, which is one of the highest totals ever recorded for the county in a year. Um, but the real meltdown was the fact that my my camera broke. My trusty P900 uh, just quit working, and I had for like for the best part of the year from uh, September through December. Um, every rarity that showed up, I had to just get um, photos of with my 
iPhone 6s through my binoculars. So they were really nothing special. Um, so yeah, this is this is just kind of where like the real meltdown happened. Um, then in uh, early 2021, I decided that about four months of not having a a functional camera was was enough, and I was like. I had the P900, I wanted an upgrade, but I didn't want to completely dive into the world of DSLRs because I knew that mirrorless cameras were starting to ramp up and I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna go from uh, never having really used a, like a, I guess you could say a professional camera just straight into using a professional camera. So I got the P1000, which quite frankly is a huge upgrade from the P900. Uh, and I, 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 I loved it and I still, and I still really do like it. I mean, I, I use it. It's so lightweight. Um, it's really, really amazing just for all around, uh, all around photography. Cause you have the amazing zoom range of 24 to 3000 millimeters. Um, I've got a little list of pros and cons here of the P1000 specifically. Um, it's really easy to use. Um, it has a large grip, like a full size DSLR. It really feel, it doesn't feel like a tiny point and shoot when you're holding it. Uh, it's very, very lightweight. Um, it's because of uh, because of the 125 times optical zoom. Um, it's really easy to get to go from telephoto to macro to wide angle shots um, in a very short amount of time. You don't change the lens or anything. I would say that it's also a, a good pro for this camera is that it's it's very durable. I have um, I did one time accidentally close it in a door, uh, and and nothing happened to it. Um, the, uh, it, I, I actually think that probably the, the, uh, the best pro out of it is the, um, not three axis. I think it's, I think it's a five axis LCD screen. It's completely, um, adjustable to almost any angle you, you could think of, which I know a lot of, a lot of cameras now are, are, um, either don't have or are working towards, um, having. Uh, I know that a lot of point and shoots don't have an extended viewfinder, so it's almost like you're you're tilting the camera at a really weird angle to to be able to look through the viewfinder. But this, it's like it's like a it's it's got the nice extended viewfinder, so you can just look at it and not have to tilt it or anything. Um, it has functional manual focus, which a lot of um, point and shoot cameras do not have, uh, and it has the built-in flash, which is really great for. Um, a, a lot of a lot of macro setting or a lot of like macro scenarios but also just if you ever need a flash you've got it built in you don't need to have an external flash um a few of the cons uh for the p1000 are the fact that the the autofocus speed is really bad it's really hard to um lock on to to something moving um because it likes to it likes to just back focus all the way and then and then find whatever uh, your subject is so it makes um, action photos really tough. Um, the low quality pixels um, are are not that great to work with. It leaves very little room to crop your photos. Um, your photos really become grainy after. Uh, oops, <laughs> uh, they really become grainy after ISO 1600. Um, you have a really long buffer on your fastest frame rate, which is. Uh, seven frames per second. It takes almost 45 seconds for the camera to be able to take another photo um, in that time. Uh, your quality degrades, your image quality degrades a lot after 1500 millimeters. The OEM battery dies after around 250 photos. Um, and sometimes after a lot of use, the zoom toggle switch will catch and it will make it so that if you want to make a tiny adjustment, it'll just catch and it'll go either all the way out or all the way in. And um, the just something that that really kind of frustrated me about it was the fact that the uh, the rubber the rubber on the grip started to fall off after just a couple of months of having it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I still I still do really enjoy using it if I if I don't want to carry um, a big a big heavy setup around. Um, so yeah, um, another great option for a point and shoot camera, um, if you're looking to get one or looking to upgrade is the Sony RX10 Mark IV. Um, it has, I mean, I'll just say it's amazing because it's Sony. Um, Sony really has the, uh, 
the camera game figured out right now. Um, it does have a larger sensor than most um, point and shoots at 20.1 megapixels. Um, you still get a really good zoom range from 24 to 600 millimeters. It, it is much smaller than the P1000. I would say it's more on par with the P900 if you're familiar with those. Um, it's again, very easy to use. It also has functional manual focus. It has extremely fast autofocus compared to many other um, uh, point and shoot cameras. Uh, it has full use of 315 autofocus points, um, which many um, uh, point and shoot cameras do not have. It also has autofocus tracking capabilities, which many point and shoots don't have. And you have a fairly high frame rate at 24 frames per second um, with very little buffer. I think the buffer is, oh man, I think it's almost it might, it might actually be an endless buffer, I think. I could be wrong about that, but it might be an endless buffer. Um, another great option is the Canon PowerShot SX540HS. It has 20.3 megapixels, uh, 24 to 1200 millimeter zoom. Um, it's very, very small, as you can see in the photo pictured here. Um, if it fits in the palm of your hand, fully extended very easily. Um, again, very easy to use, has a, a frame rate of five frames per second. Um, and it also has a built-in flash. Um, and then here, if you'd like to take a picture or write any of these down, if you're in the market for buying a new, uh, if you're in the market for buying a new point and shoot or upgrading from one point and shoot to, the, to another, here's a good list that I have picked out of at least my favorite point and shoots that I've used or that I've tested or that I've seen people take really good photos from. I'll give you guys a minute if you're writing these down. Uh, but yeah, I mean, in my opinion, I think uh, that the entire world of point and shoot photography is, has come a really long way. I mean, we we went from tiny little like wallet sized cameras that were taking decent photos at, at a for for the time at least that we're at a fairly high price point to now having these like super zoom point and shoots at a fairly low price point um, that are taking quite frankly, really good photos. Um, so yeah, here, here's a, just a couple example of, I, I personally find the image quality on the RX-10, the Sony RX-10 to be phenomenal. Um, here's a photo at 600 millimeters cropped in very far and you can see very little definition was lost. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I will jump right into the uh, macro part of this presentation. Um, I also will refer to it as the low end of the zoom range just because macro um, doesn't, or I guess in, in the title of the presentation, doesn't necessarily mean super close up photos. Um, here's a couple of things to remember. Many point and shoots with functional manual focus will allow you to zoom further in on your subject and focus clearly rather than keeping your photo on auto or your camera on autofocus. Um, your camera will have a hard time finding enough contrast to be able to focus on. If you switch your camera to manual focus, if you have the ability to, you'll be able to zoom in a little bit further and focus closer. Um, I'm pretty sure most, if not all, um, point and shoot cameras have focus peaking uh, when you're in manual focus, and it really does help you to see exactly how much is in focus and where. Um, Another thing to remember is casting shadows by getting too close to your subject can throw off the whole photo. So really using your like the amazing zoom capabilities that these cameras have and finding the sweet spot for the shot that you want is key. And also don't be afraid to just get as, as low as possible depending on whatever you're shooting. I mean, if you've got a if you've got a flower that's a foot off the ground, uh, standing up at whatever how, however tall you are might might not get you the the photo that you're that you're looking for. So um, I, the whole kind of structure of this, I, I will say the whole structure of this presentation is just kind of based on uh, giving giving some like real life examples of um, like the general types of um, like the, the two different uh, ranges of, of Zoom for this. And um, yeah, I'll just kind of talk a little bit about my like experiences with with kind of finding finding the wildlife and, and making sure that I was getting the shots that I really wanted. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm sure that in Wisconsin, if you're at the right place, um, Eastern giant swallowtails are in a, no shortage and um, really knowing, especially if you're, if you're looking for a certain species to, to photograph, really knowing the species and its behavior and it's um, just kind of 
as much as you as much as you can find out about it is is really important. Um, for example, the host plant for the eastern giant swallowtail is the prickly ash. Um, so knowing that there's prickly ash at a location that you want to photograph giant swallowtail caterpillars at is very important. Um, here is a central eastern newt. Um, I mean, really, here you can see how um, this was again just taken um, at. 128 millimeters and 40 millimeters, and I got two like drastically different photos of of the same of the same newt here. Um, one is much closer up, and um, and the other one is a bit more of like kind of like a habitat shot. Um, which I mean, I think for me, just kind of really, really is impressive because it, with with any other camera, you'd have to switch lenses, which means that you'd have to have another lens, and you'd have spent more money on buying that. So if you have a point and shoot, you don't have to do any switching of lenses, anything like that. You just zoom in or zoom out, and then you have two drastically different photos. Um, here's a, the, the, I think that the story behind this was just kind of cool. I, I think it was, I want to say it was the beginning of December and it was an oddly warm day. And I walked out outside of my house um, and, and I just saw this, I saw this, greater angle wing Katie did um, sitting on my neighbor's flowers, uh, which were also still blooming in December, which was a little bit weird. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I think, um, I think I kind of, I kind of went against one of the reminders that I gave myself. It, as you can see in the left photo, there is a little bit of a shadow cast on the flower from where um, the, my, my lens was blocking a little bit of the flash here. Um, but yeah, I think, um, just kind of, yeah, that's, that's that one. Um, uh, I guess I, I probably should have put a, uh, warning that there are going to be a couple snakes in this. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's, there's going to be a couple of snakes in this, in this part of it. Um, what I, what I will say about, uh, getting moving photos at kind of, very close up, um, like close up photos of a moving subject um, at at a high ha higher power um, is just making making especially if you're on manual focus to be able to get as close as you can. Um, just kind of kind of making sure that you are exactly like where you need to be um, is pretty important. Um, so at least for this one, uh, there was fading light. Um, it was it was almost almost dark it was getting getting to being very dark um and uh yeah just kind of like making sure that when you're photographing and moving subject at high power um or high magnification yeah just making sure that you are where exactly where you need to be is, is pretty important um yeah this is um this is two um i guess two examples of uh how um Using using different shutter speeds can get different levels of detail um, in very similar photos. The, the left photo is at one one hundred twenty fifth of a second um, at one hundred millimeters, and the right photo um, was one twenty fifth of a second at ninety five millimeters. Um, I think that the photo on the right is a little bit clearer, a little bit sharper. Um, you can see a little bit more definition in the head and on the on the legs in that area. Um, so just kind of playing around, especially if you have a sedentary subject with, with all of your different settings, making sure that you're getting the sharpest photo possible um, is always is always good to keep in mind. Um, this was uh, with the this I I also I guess I, I should have said earlier that all with the with some very very few exceptions um, all of these photos are taken on the Nikon P1000, uh, with the exception of this one, this was on the Sony RX10. Um, and yeah, just kind of like, uh, I would, I would say that the, the big thing with, with this photo, at least is that this frog was sitting on my thumb. So for me to be able to hold like the, the, the weight of these cameras being so light really does make it super easy to be able to hold with one hand the camera and still focus on something that's really small. 
um, and get a and get a photo that that you really like. Um, so I would I would definitely say that like knowing knowing that you have a very lightweight camera means that you might be able to get a shot that you otherwise might not be able to uh, with a different with a different camera setup. Um, here's uh, another another example of um, just kind of the the like low end of the zoom range how the left photo was at 120 millimeters and the right photo was at 210 um there is there is a difference in the depth of field of course um even though they are at fairly similar um uh apertures um the depth of field at 120 millimeters focusing much closer is a whole lot greater than at 210 for much further away um and yeah just kind of kind of playing around with your depth of field especially if you're zooming in and out from subjects that are closer or farther away can get you a shot that you're a little bit more happy with um i thought i i think a, a few a few of these photos are just in here because they're they're some of my favorites that i've gotten uh this was a red spotted purple that i saw um in north carolina the water was really cool behind this because it was all those little green spots are fish um, in the background, um, which I just thought was pretty cool. Um, kind of going along some like the idea of photographing some flowers, um, pretty pretty much just along the same lines as everything else. Um, really just playing around with zooming in and out and getting the right depth of field for for the photo that you want to get um, is really just kind of key for getting flowers, especially because there's so many different layers and parts to a flower that you might want to capture in your photo um so yeah just with with almost all of the with almost everything here just kind of making sure that you use the right like focal length for for the photo that you're getting is very important um another that's just kind of one of my one of my favorite photos that i've that i've taken um that i thought was pretty cool um and just another example of playing around with um, with the with very different focal lengths. This was at 100 millimeters, but if I wanted to, I could have gotten a very similar shot at uh, something like 50 millimeters, or I could have backed up and gotten a similar shot at say a thousand millimeters. Um, but yeah, just kind of really really making sure that you're getting what's right for you and the scenario you're in. Uh, in summary, um, keeping your shutter speeds fairly low with macro, um, your subjects aren't going to be moving around a whole lot uh, for wider habitat shots, um, keeping your aperture closed in gets a few more background details. And for close up details, keep, keeping your aperture wide open uh, really does help to blur distractions. Um, and yeah, just kind of whatever you can do to like eliminate potential distractions from the photo is also pretty important. So if you've got a flower or you've got um, a salamander or something and you have like a stick that's in the way or you have like a or just or a blade of grass or anything, just kind of making sure that you've got the um, like the overall composition of your photo right is, is pretty important, I'd say. Um, and next is uh, still on the fairly low end of the zoom range, um, but going for like the small in frame idea, I know that this uh, this uh, concept has kind of been revolutionized in the last few years, I'd say. Um, and there's there's a lot of photographers who are now like taking some really incredible small and frame photos where the subject is very obvious, but it isn't large in the frame. Um, here, uh, you've got some sandhill cranes. Um, it is, it is uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty cool to be able to like have the, um, like the ability to i mean really really with with all of these photos honestly it's really cool to be able to have the ability to um go from a macro photo to a small in frame to a super telephoto um photo in no time at all um the these were uh this is another example of how using the weight of your camera to your advantages is really helpful um i was on lake michigan i saw some red breasted mergansers way off in the distance and i stood on a rock that was right over the lake i flipped the screen out 
Um, and I held my camera right over, <laughs> right over the lake. And I got these fairly eye level photos, which I think ended up working in my favor because of a, how lightweight the camera was and B because of the rotating screen. Um, this was, I believe that this was this Anhanga photo I took on a boat. I want to, yeah, we, I mean, I know I was on a boat, but I don't remember. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the scenario for this was that the boat was moving. Um, and it was really hard with five other people on the boat to be able to get this photo. Um, and also just having a really compact camera that can zoom really far. Um, is really helpful because then if you're in a crowded space where a lot of people are trying to get similar photos, you're not swinging a big lens around or or whatever it is that might um, that might not make the situation as as good as it could be. Um, here's um, another kind of small small in frame idea where it's a little a little more subtle um, with the rattlesnake sitting on the side of the road. This one was. Uh, a little bit more rushed because as you can see and if you look in the top left uh, corner of the photo there is rain that was moving in so I was a little bit rushed to get this but um, yeah that one's that uh, and then just kind of along along the uh, like the very far boundaries of small and frame I think at the point in which your subject becomes less of the like focal point of your photo and just more of like a uh, just a small detail then I would say zooming in and uh, making making your subject less of less of a, a small detail and more of the more of like the really like the foundation of your photo um, is is pretty important uh, here's some American habitats from Utah at, at, the, at the Great Salt Lake um, this was almost at sunrise, so kind of getting uh, getting getting the birds as they were waking up um, was cool, but also getting getting my settings right so that I wasn't getting too grainy of photos and making sure that the colors were all right was was pretty important for that one. Yeah, so in summary, for uh, small in frame, uh, keeping your subject the primary focus, incor incorporating interesting background or foreground elements always always helps accentuate the photo. Um, keeping your mind open to the unexpected, um, just like in, a, oh, I guess it was in the Roadrunner photo, um, how you really, I wasn't, I personally wasn't expecting to have a Roadrunner fly up on a dead stick right in front of that really rugged mountain. Um, and then just like with um, really with close ups, um, eliminating large distractors from the main focus of the photo is, um, is pretty important. Here we have the telephoto range of point and shoot cameras. Um, as in in all of these, um, the kind of common common theme is just going to be using your really high power to your advantage. Another um, another huge oh, excuse me another huge plus for point and shoot cameras is that the aperture at these really high magnifications stays very wide so for example this was taken at 1100 millimeters at iso 200 f at f 5.6 um i don't think that there are any um 11 or a thousand plus millimeter lenses that are uh around 5.6 f 5.6 um so really just knowing that you can take like very sharp photos at these really high powers um is is definitely something to remember and you using using the range of zoom that you have is always is always a good a good um thing to go for so here this was um th th these were both i guess this was kind of a, around the range that you'd find for a, a typical telephoto lens with still very high power this was 500 at f3 and 480 at f4 um both at still fairly slow shutter speeds um and yeah i think um yeah, so that, that's that um this was these two were taken at 500 and 700 millimeters um i guess depending depending on the situation obviously for just like any photo um you're you're gonna want to change all of your settings depending on how depending on the type of photo you want to get 
Um, and then I think, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that, that's that. Um, the, the, oops. Uh, these were taken at 750 and 800 millimeters, uh, both at F4 and ISO 100 um, on a, this was fairly early in the morning um, on, a, on a cloudy day. Um, so yeah, still just kind of like understanding that, you're, that, that your camera, if you, if you have a point and shoot, is able to take really sharp photos at low ISOs at high power um, is always just something to really keep in the forefront of your mind. Oops. Um, this, these were taken at 1200 and 600 millimeters, uh, at, both at F4. Um, you can see the difference in sharpness is almost non-existent considering they were both at the same ISO, same aperture, same shutter speed. Um, but still at double the, the, the left photo is taken at double the focal length of the right photo. And there's almost no loss in, in clarity at all. Um, which I find to be very impressive. Um, the, these were taken at 11 or, uh, sorry, a uh, thousand millimeters and 800 millimeters, both at F5.6 to just get a little bit more detail of the whole bird. Um, and this was, this was actually just a really cool, a cool story behind this one. It's, uh, one of this was in particular was one of the earliest purple sandpipers in the, in ever to show up in inland U.S. history. Um, and just how ridiculously close uh, this bird came up to the the group of us that was watching. It was really amazing. I mean, at one point um, we were laying down on the pier and on almost on the edge of this pier at, at um, if you're familiar with Chicago Montrose Point Bird Sanctuary is where it was. Um, and it was walking less than three feet away from us and sometimes just not even paying any attention. Um, so yeah, that was that was just pretty incredible. Um, now, uh, both of these were taken at a thousand millimeters. Um, the one thing I will say about both of these is that sometimes I really personally don't know why, um, why these cameras do this. I, I've noticed it with the P1000. I've noticed it with the RX10. I've noticed it with, um, Canon power shots that you can take two very similar photos in the exact same condition at almost the same settings and have like drastically different levels of sharpness. Again, I really don't know why it happens. I don't know. Um, I don't know how to control that, but it is definitely something to, to look out for. Um, just kind of making sure that um, your, your camera's doing what it needs to do. Um, and yeah, I think um, along along that line, I have also noticed. I, I don't I don't think I had this in the beginning, but I I have personally noticed that there are kind of like micro adjustments that many I think most point and shoot cameras will make, even if you're in completely manual settings. Um, there are micro adjustments that your camera will make, especially with um, especially with how the with how the meter of your camera reads light. Um, and I, I personally don't know if there is any way to take control over that, um, but it is it it is something to look out for, especially if you're not wanting to lose definition in your photos and not and, and not lose clarity. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something to look out for. Um, then another thing with um, with like capturing motion or uh, capturing like action uh especially is just making sure that um for your focal length and your your iso and your uh your aperture you have the right shutter speed for for because it is a little bit confusing i mean if you have a dslr with a 400 millimeter lens um you might not be shooting at the same settings that you would be at a thousand millimeters say uh, just because it's such a drastic difference um, and so, yeah, just kind of compensating for, for your, in, your drastically increased focal length is always very important. Um, and then, yeah, you can, th this is, I think, just another example of, of sharpness at extremely high power at very, um, 
close range. So these these birds in, in up in the Saxon bog in Minnesota were extremely close to the feeder stations. And you're able to zoom in extremely far at just a, like, I would say these, these birds were probably 12 feet away. Um, so being able to get really up close details from close range uh, is good with the relatively low minimum focus distances for, for such high power. I mean, uh, I personally with, um, with the Nikon 500 millimeter um, fixed lens, it has a 10 foot minimum focus distance while the Nikon P1000 has a 12 foot minimum focus distance at 3000 millimeters. So that's a, uh, a bit of a, a bit of a, a big difference in, in minimum focus distance, like the ratio between minimum focus distance and uh, your focal length between a point and shoot and a DSLR. So um, in summary, uh, a higher shutter speed helps. Um, but many bridge cameras don't do as well with higher shutter speeds as the ISO range is so minimal. I know most of them don't even go past ISO 6400. And like I said, with the P1000, at least you start to see grain after ISO 1600, no matter, no matter how much light there is. Um, and then, yeah, I know that it's really easy to zoom in super far on a subject, um, but just kind of keeping your subject entirely in the frame and keeping composition in mind is really important. If you have um, uh, a thousand plus millimeters or 2000 or 3000 millimeters at your disposal, it can be really easy to just want to like go all in and use the entire zoom range on, on one subject, just get it as close as possible. But sometimes just treating it just like you would any other photo um, and using the super high power zoom only if you really need it um i would say is is uh what what you should keep in mind um and then here's a couple side by sides um between uh like low and high end and how there's very little difference in in clarity if a black rosy finch on the left that was taken at 300 millimeters um and then on the right there's at the same, this is the exact same bird at 1200 millimeters. Um, and it, it I, I think like what it, what it kind of shows is that if you have a point and shoot camera that has a crazy high zoom range, you really don't even need to crop your photos to be able to, to zoom in because you have the ability to just zoom in a little bit farther than you would otherwise. Um, like this, the, the dusky grouse on the left was almost uh, a macro photo. I mean, it was, the bird, I wish I had, had the photo uh, that my mom took of this bird walking around almost between my legs. I mean, I think if I hadn't have, if I hadn't have moved, I think it might have walked right between my legs. Um, so yeah, at, uh, at 120 millimeters on the left and 1,050 millimeters on the right, again, very little difference in clarity. Um, and still, and still, I overall very good photos. Uh, and then here's a couple of non wildlife examples that, that point and shooters point and shoots are just really good at capturing. Uh, the moon, for one, um, I would definitely say that the difference between trying to take a photo of the moon at 400, 500, 600 millimeters on a on a DSLR lens uh, is crazy different than taking a photo of the moon at a thousand plus millimeters or if you have the nikon p1000 at three thousand millimeters i mean there, there are some nights if the moon is big enough um if you're zoomed into three thousand millimeters you can't even fit the whole moon in frame in the frame so the moon is definitely something that is really fun to just take super up close photos of um, I have also been able to take photos of Jupiter and Saturn and Mars, um, but because of uh, the really low resolution, it's hard to actually see any detail. Um, you also have to deal with light dome and all that other stuff. Uh, the sun in the right conditions. This was like the only, that there have been two times where I've ever taken a picture of the sun. Uh, and they've both been when wild fi wildfires from California have blown a lot of smoke into the area and right as it was setting. So it was it was safe to look at the sun just 
naked eye as it was setting because there was so much smoke in the air that it was completely hazing it over. Um, yeah, so both both of these were taken actually two years apart, um, but both due to crazy wildfires um, from out in California blowing smoke into the area. Um, I guess there's I guess there's three three exceptions, and this was just a little bit more abstract. And then sunsets, because just like any other camera, point shoots are incredible at capturing like really accurate color. Um, so yeah, getting getting really good sunset photos are always um, are always something something fun to get. Um, yeah, so that's it. Um, I would love to take any questions um, if you have them. Steve here. I'm curious, what software do you use post processing? Uh, so for a long time, I used Luminar, just like the the base level Luminar AI. Um, and now that I, I when I, a couple months ago, when I upgraded camera gear, I finally got Lightroom. Also, when, when I got my university email address and it became a lot cheaper, I, I finally started using Lightroom. But um, yeah, Luminar, Luminar AI is what I used to edit all of those. And, and really, I... I never, I never really did a whole lot of editing to my photos, just because I, I always liked the, the, the challenge of taking a, a photo that didn't really need that much editing out in the field. Uh, but yeah, Luminar, Luminar AI. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I have a friend that has a Sony Bridge camera, about five years okay. old. And he has a macro piece that he. Um, Kind of snaps over the front. Do you know anything about getting close-ups? Do some of these cameras have attachments so you can get a little closer? Oh, I have actually never heard about that, but I would assume that there's probably some sort of like magnification, like filter that you could put on any, on really any yeah, I think bridge you're camera. Right. Was, yeah, I think it was just a magnification of some kind yeah right yeah i mean the only thing i would i would warn against doing that is that you get a lot of like stretching on the edges of your photos and it will also probably like downgrade your quality a lot but if that's if you would like to get a little bit closer when doing macro photos go for it you could you could find a a high quality magnification filter i'm sure for a for a bridge camera Probably at Hunt's photo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gary, do you guys have those? Yeah, we certainly do. Yeah, we have the close up. We have all different type of filters, close up filters. Um, so Great. there you go. Um, yes, we do. We we do have it. You could you could you could um. I'll I'll have my contact in an email um, when I send it to Steve. That you can you can um, ask about. But we carry we carry uh, we carry all type. We carry all the major bridge cameras from Panasonic to Nikon to Canon. The Sony, we have we have them all in stock at, at affordable prices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions? I have a question. This is uh -huh. Jill. Um, is mm -hmm. everything that you showed us uh tonight from handheld, or do you ever use a tripod? I I think the first time I ever used a tripod to take a photo was like last week in my backyard when I <laughs> when I tried to take some photos of of a nebula way up in up in outer space. But no, these all handheld. Everything okay. everything was handheld, and mostly because like bridge cameras are so lightweight. Like I think I mean the 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 Nikon P one thousand is definitely the heaviest. Uh, I wish I had it right in front of me. Um, it's definitely the heaviest um, bridge camera that I can think of, and I think it only weighs three pounds. So nice. um, you're you're really not looking at at a whole lot of weight. I've actually okay. seen a decline. In, I've actually seen a decline in tripods. I saw saw a decline in tripods even before the pandemic. 
um, mm -hmm. tripods are slowing down, but um, more and more people, I mean, love to sell you a tripod. You want to buy a tripod, I'll sell you one. But um, but really, tripods are slowed down. More and more people go on mirrors, and there's and because of the going mirrors, they're lighter, so they don't really need tripods to um, you know, to use for mirrorless cameras. It was more for the heavy stuff. Um, I personally just started shooting about a year and a half ago. Um, I've been doing this for 20 years and I never shot until recently. Um, but, um, I, I, and I, I don't use a tripod because I like the versatility of just like, um, not have to worry about the tripod, just walking around versatile and not, you know, and just going around where I can go and not have to worry about carrying a tripod. So I like that versatility, um, of, of, of that, of, of doing that, but try some tripods, you get, you do have to use tripod for certain things. You do a night photography or sometimes landscape, but it right, really, right. but I'm seeing, I'm seeing less and less people i'm seeing less and less tripods in in in, in the field um now yeah because camera exactly. gear in general is just getting so much like lighter weight yeah in addition to i might add this is steve cole uh your, a lot of your mirrorless now have in body stabilization stabilization mm -hmm. in the camera bodies themselves along then of course if you use a, a lens that stabilizes so it it really it really makes a difference i can shoot my 100 to 400 fuji uh, handheld at 101 over 15th and it's oh yeah up nice i i have the uh i have the nikon z62 now which has built-in in-body image stabilization and um i've been getting really into all sorts of night photography especially in downtown chicago and i have been doing handheld second long exposures to get light trails and keeping keeping what I want to be sharp and completely sharp. So definitely the uh, in-body image stabilization capabilities are getting really incredible with newer cameras, which is good because um, bridge cameras, I think most new ones have in-body image stabilization considering the fact that they are mirrorless in and of themselves. Um, yeah, I mean, I like, I, I forgot to mention, but especially like using, using the P1000 at, 3000 millimeters if you're fully zoomed in and you're holding yourself steady there's like zero shake at all it's it's pretty it's pretty impressive mm -hmm. why don't you so. tell the difference why, why don't you tell what why don't you tell since you bought since you have to use a p1000 and z6 why don't you tell what, what your experience is about the difference i mean i see some people do it's not bridge right this is a bridge thing but I'm just curious to know what your difference is with using it since you upgraded mm -hmm. so I mean, I think, I think for me, the, like, it, it was a total shock to my system the first time that I used a non, a non bridge camera. And that was when, like one time that my brother let me use this Canon 70 Mark IV or uh, Mark II. Um, and I was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. Um, but I was also a little bit kind of like weirded out because with the P1000, I was so used to having a live viewfinder. Um, and then I went to having a, viewfinder where it was just like um whatever what the what the mirrors were the pentamira system was reflecting um and then going from the uh p1000 to the z62 the biggest differences have been just in the overall speed of the camera like especially from from autofocus and i mean even then the the z62 isn't known for like top of the line autofocus, but going from going from something that that would completely back focus just to get something that was obviously already mostly in focus to get it in focus with the P1000, that was just that was just ridiculous. And so now I've got a much, a much better system going. And it's it's like it's a it's a whole world of difference. It's it's pretty amazing. Do you have any shots you can share? Do you have any shots on Z6 you can share? Sure. Yeah. Let me pull up a few in the meantime just another question uh, do you know anything about the uh, difference of using something like the sony uh, rx100 as a bridge camera it doesn't have quite the range but it's even smaller and lighter oh um you know i'm not totally sure i i won't um i can't say that i'm that I've used, I mean, I definitely haven't used it. Um, I can't really speak on it too much because I haven't looked at the technical specifications really. Um, but I would, I would just make the assumption that because it is Sony, it's still going to be pretty good, even if it isn't like amazing. Um, 
I also don't know how much it costs. So it would be good to compare like what, like the, the, the spec, like the, the, the specs that you're getting for the RX 100 versus something else that's at a similar price point. Um, I would definitely, definitely like compare that between different brands and different models, just so that, just so that you feel like for, for what, you, for like the money that you're putting into it, um, you're getting like what you want, you're getting what you want to have. Um, and then, yeah, here, let me. Like, Wait, what was your them. question, D Dave? What was your question about the RX-10? Well, uh, the difference between the RX-10 and the RX-100 is using it as a bridge camera because the RX-100 uh, is so much smaller. It doesn't have the same range, but I think a lot of people have used it, particularly for street photography and, and things like that. Yes, I've heard. I mean, I, I've, I'm not my, my Noah's a lot more. My assistant's a lot more into that thing and knows a lot more about that type of thing. But I've heard from many people that the RX10 is a really good camera. And it's a big and it's, it's a much bigger upgrade, and the quality of the stuff is, is a lot is a lot better than than that one. So you wouldn't be going in RX10. You definitely wouldn't be dis, dis, disappointed with it. But um, if you want to drop me an email, I can. If you want to drop me an email, you want to put it down. Uh, my email is gfaber at huntsphoto.com. So it's G F A R B I. You can email me and I what the thing is that I and I can get you an answer on it. But you wouldn't be disappointed with the with, with, with that camera. My my mom bought a an RX10 from from Hunts, I think a, over a year ago now. And there are still times where she will get a better photo than me and we'll be standing next to each other. So you you definitely will not be disappointed at all. Yeah. But um yeah here like like Gary Gary asked if I had any uh, photos from uh, my my new camera setup which is uh, the Nikon Z62 I have a couple different lenses um, most of these uh, or most of these first ones are taken with the Tamron 90 millimeter macro um, this is um, a species of moss in the Calicladium family um, and I mean gosh just you could you can get so close i mean honestly i'll i'll look at i'll look at moss with my naked eye and I'll be like oh it just looks like a little red stem and you'd never you'd never assume that there was like this like crazy looking almost flower at the end of it um which is pretty cool got some mushrooms these are really small mushrooms um the uh depth of field is really impressive on on the 90 millimeter macro this is a, an old virginia mountain mint uh, seed head uh, and then here, this is um, really, really gorgeous adult male harlequin duck from last weekend um, with the Tamron 150 to 600 lens. Here it is again with some golden eye. And then uh, I, I don't know if any of you guys are following the recent rare bird alerts, but Chicago has a Ross's gull right now. Um, it's been seen, all, I think it's been seen every day since... Sunday, I want to say when it was found. Um, it, it was it was funny. I I was pulling into the parking spot at the at the beach where this harlequin duck was, and I look at my phone and I see a photo of this bird right here, and I lost my mind. So then I, I sprinted to the beach, I grabbed the harlequin, I got photos of the harlequin duck, and then I raced back to the car and I got I, I drove the hour down to the opposite end of Chicago to go get this Ross's gall where it put on a show for us. I mean, it was just incredible. The views this bird was giving for, I mean, for a, for a bird that belongs in the Arctic circle to be down here in the first place is just amazing. Also for it to be here in March, and I, I'm getting so excited about this just because it's like bird of bird of a decade, really. Um, but yeah, it was, it, it put on, it really did put on a show for us. And it did, at one point it made a pass um, less, than, less than 10 feet from my head. And it, it was so close that I was, I was following my camera. I couldn't even, I, I lost it at one point. It was so close. So um, they, I think that this one right here is my, my favorite from, from all the Ross's golf photos. But yeah, what a, just a, a gorgeous bird. Um, I got a, I got a, I happened to get a picture of it when it flew in front of the Sears Tower <laughs> from many miles away, um, but that's that's got to be a first for for that. And I don't know if anyone's ever gotten a photo of a Ross's gull with the Sears Tower in the background. Um, and then yeah, a couple more macro photos from later that day. Here's a really small mushroom. 
detail of the mushroom. Um, some more cool jelly fungi, which are cool. The uh, really close up of, of um, some lichens. And then uh, a Ross's goose. It was a double Ross's day. Ross's gall and Ross's goose in the same day, which was pretty cool. And um, yeah, this, these were, this was almost in darkness and the, uh, the dynamic range of the, of the Z62, even, even at a fairly, I mean, I guess fairly closed in at, at F6.3, you can still, you can still do a lot with the, with the smaller sensor on the Z62. So um, I would recommend if you're, if you're looking to go into an entry level mirrorless camera, I would totally recommend the Nikon Z6 II. Um, it takes fantastic photos in my opinion. So yeah, those are some recent photos that I've gotten with my new setup. Yeah. You guys have any questions for Simon? Oh, thank you, Tom. I, uh, I, I really appreciate it. I, I just love, I just love doing it. I love going out and taking, taking photos. And, you know, I, I think I, I, sh I showed at the beginning of the, the slideshow, just how it, it was just really photography for me. Wasn't like the, the main focus. And I, I still would say just kind of like the overall excitement of just seeing something is like my, my main, my main thing for, for, all wildlife but i think definitely now I, I try and go for the best photo that i can get um whenever whenever i go out i uh at least for when my when my brother and i do do uh car photography we we could see like nothing crazy no, no exotics no, nothing at all um but if i get one cool photo of something then i'll i'll come home happy um yeah thank you, you kelly say, you, we kid around. I kid around with Simon all the time. So you, you could probably shoot for twenty four hours straight if you if you if 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 you're allowed to, right? Oh, I, I I totally would. I mean, if I if I could be up from midnight to midnight, I would I would have endless endless things to go photograph. So yeah, great presentation, Simon. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, thank I, you. I admire your dedication to wildlife and conservation. And I'm amazed by your knowledge of all of that. It's you've it's been very impressive. And I think um, if I worked for Hunts Photo, you've done a good job in the last five minutes to sell the Nikon Z62 because of your images that you, that you just shared. So yeah, I would nice. I would definitely recommend it if you're if you're looking to go into mirrorless. Talk to Gary about the the Nikon Z62. Mm -hmm. I will tell you one thing. I mean, I'm not, I don't like to sell stuff. These, these, these programs are designed to be educational and not sheltering, but you know, so I try to be, I don't try to hot sell because that's, that's not my personality. Um, but I will, I will say that we are running a very special promotion. Uh, it's the first time ever that we're running this um, to our customers around the country. And I'll put it in an email that will think thing, but we're running 18 months financing free. Uh, for for starting today until in, until until next Wednesday, um, you have to fill out a form um, to do it. Um, but if you are interested in doing it, it's a we've never run this ever before. Um, so we, we thanks to the a lot of companies that supported us on this thing. We're going to give it a try, and it's basically anything. It's it's basically anything in our store over three hundred dollars. You get eighteen months finance free. Um, as long as you pay in time, as long as you pay within 18 months, you have no, there's no, you get, you get, you don't get any, you don't, you don't get any, um, you know, you don't have to pay any, you don't have to pay anything back as long as you pay 18 months time, there's no penalties. So I'll put that in, in, in an email, um, along with, along with, of, of all that stuff that I've been talking about with, with specials. Great. Thank you. And I'll mm -hmm. include your, um, all of your email addresses in the, the summary that I send out as well. So I think we'll have that covered. So. Thanks to Hunt's Photography and to Simon. Uh, I think we're going to call it a day. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you yeah. for having me. I, I really did enjoy this. Good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you, Simon. You did a great job, as always. Thank you, Gary. See All you right. later. Thank you. I see you. Good night. Good night. All right. Well, thank you again. I uh, I hope you guys all enjoyed this. I. Yeah, this was this was great for me. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Simon. Okay. Good night. All right. Good night.